Hi, thank you guys so much for having me. We're in the Basketball Hall of Fame, and it's the NBA Finals. I thought I should run on stage, but I'm wearing heels, so that didn't work out as well as I had planned. Um, I'm so pleased to be here. Uh, just a little background on me. I am a survivorship doctor at Memorial Sloan Kettering. I work in their adult survivorship program where we mostly take care of um, adults who were treated for cancer in childhood or adolescence. So that might, I'm gonna bring in some data from that group, but everything I'm talking about applies to every survivor out there in some shape or form. Um, so just to start, I have no relevant financial relationships that exist that need to be disclosed. Um, so the objectives for my conversation with you today is to provide a framework to understand your cancer therapy associated long-term risks. Um, it's often helpful to have a, a general visualization of how these things affect us as opposed to very specific to your diagnosis because sometimes it's harder to find information if you just look at the very, very specific bit that you know about yourself. So I wanna provide you with those tools. Um, also to review some more common late effects of cancer therapy in survivors, and then to understand the evidence for this surveillance. Like why do we watch for and, and try to um, keep our mind on second cancers and cardiovascular complications? So as, um, as Dr. Burton so clearly put, a lot of people have different definitions of what survivorship is. Um, the National Cancer Institute uh, believes it begins at the beginning of diagnosis. Um, Institute of Medicine talks about the post-treatment phase. But the most important statistic about this is there's 15.5 million survivors of cancers in the United States. It's a pretty substantial portion of our population. And it's estimated to grow greater than, tw to greater than 20 million by 2026. Um, that means there's a lot of you wonderful people in the audience out there um, that perhaps as you've gone through the process, find out how many people um, you know are actually survivors as well. And so you serve as this important point of delivery of sh sharing information because I definitely will never be able to speak to 20 million people at one time. So, so this is uh, one piece of information that I think is helpful to understanding um, why, we, why cancer survivorship is so important. So this is a graphic from a study that was published in 2016, and it uses a big population of survivors of childhood cancer. So understandably for this, this may not specifically apply to every person in this room, but what we do see is that they looked at different treatment eras and it shows that from the 70s to the 80s to the 90s, and we don't have 2000s and 2010s yet, we have done a better and better job of preventing death, preventing recurrence, and, and dying from health-related causes. That's just to speak to why we have so many survivors. You know, cancer 50, 60, 70 years ago, that was something you didn't, like most people didn't come back from. Now we do. But that also means the onus is on us as providers to educate you about it, but also to do the research and understand what are the potential side effects of, of the things we give you. Like that's a very specific term in, um, in medicine that it's, it's called iatrogenic, like med medical care induced problems. <laughs> so, so during the survivorship period, which is not necessarily just post-treatment, it's post Act, perhaps just post-active treatment, so that, um, speaking to uh, Dr. Nekledov's uh, point, we have immunotherapies, we have hormone therapies, people may be on those for decades. We don't know. So this active treatment period, what, are, what, are, what do we mean by long-term and late effects? So just for terminology, a long-term effect is an effect that persists past treatment. Um, I'm gonna give you examples of this, but essentially it's something that started with treatment and continues. A late effect is something that didn't exist at the end of treatment, but could develop. And so those are two things that when you ask those questions of your primary care doctor, that doctor that Larissa put up there, that's the question. It's like, what late effects am I at risk for versus how do we manage my long-term effects? 
So why is, why is that all important? Again, this is one of these nice, nice little graphics. Um, again, from that same patient population, we call it the Childhood Cancer Survivor Study, um, where they actually had siblings of survivors and they looked at them long term. So this is information 30, 40 years out from treatment. And you can see the blue line is the survivors, the yellow line is the siblings, and you can see how much more often survivors have new cancers, cardiac problems, hearing and vision problems, and even kidney and pulmonary problems. So that's one of the reasons is that we know that from this kind of information, and um, this doesn't even include people who unfortunately may have had other medical illness before because these are most often children at the time of diagnosis. They don't tend to have diabetes and high blood pressure and high cholesterol. So all of this increased risk can almost, is kind of pretty directly from cancer treatment. So it's important to know. Now, this thankfully is information or data from um, the earlier treatment eras. We get better and better because we do think of people as survivors from the moment they're diagnosed. And we're thinking, what, if I'm picking between two treatments, your oncologist is thinking, hopefully, which one is gonna have less late or long-term effects for my patient? So what are long-term effects? These are the ones that you guys might end up trading stories about um, when you guys get your, during the breaks and lunch, peripheral neuropathy, with, like, what is it affecting in every person? A lot of people have trouble walking because of it. You might feel like you can't pick up things. I mean, these are things that unfortunately do persist after treatment, and maybe as they started, your, your physician changed the dosing, but that doesn't mean the neuropathy fully went away. Um, hot flashes for people who um, went through some sort of hormone um, mod modifying treatment, so most commonly people think of like breast cancer and tamoxifen, but there are other treatments that involve blocking hormone um, receptors. Hair loss, very important. Oftentimes people, you know, maybe your providers played down, they're like, oh, that's just so superficial, but it's a part of who you feel like. Like, you don't feel like yourself anymore when you've lost that hair, and how do you, like, that may persist, and how do you re- frame what to, not only what can we do about it, but how do you reframe who you are as things change during treatment? And then fatigue, like there's a lot of non-specific symptoms. Again, this is not an exhaustive list, but you're much more tired and you don't feel like yourself and that makes it harder for you to um, do the things that uh, make you, give you meaning to your life. And then late effects are the ones that, like I mentioned, can pop up later and you wanna keep an eye on because and you want your doctor to be also keeping an eye on. So cardiovascular disease and second cancer are the most important of those because the truth is heart disease and cancer are the two leading causes of death in America. So just like that exists in the general population that exists in our cancer survivors. We should always be aware of how cancer treatment affects those risks. And then where screening falls in terms of second cancers. Um, Again, I'm gonna speak about this as a framework. There are gonna be things that are very specific to each individual person, but I just want you to understand how we approach it. So, um, in terms of the framework, we think about the risk factors that may have contributed to the cancer development in the first place, and then the individual treatments. Um, so I say this oftentimes when I'm giving this talk to, let's say, um, residents in training, in, or doctors in training, if I have someone who had a Ewing sarcoma, which is a pediatric cancer, or Hodgkin's lymphoma, and got the same treatments, their risks are the same despite, in terms of late effects and long-term effects, even though their cancers are different. Does that make sense? So the treatments are really, really inform what we think about when we're, when we're screening. So I'm gonna spend a little bit of time on cancer risk factors, because I think those are really important to understand. One of the important concepts is something called field cancerization which is if, say, something like smoking or alcohol use was the contributor to the development of your cancer in the first place, then that potential risk still exists in some form, right? If, if there was tissue that was damaged from smoking in your lungs, even though that cancer may have been treated, even if you sm stop smoking, you still have to be aware of the risk that smoking has on that tissue and other tissue. Um, but also, 
the area around which you're treated, let's say if you get radiation to, if you get a head and neck cancer and you get radiation there, that area is also at high risk. So you wanna make sure people are doing a very thorough exam of the cancer treated areas. Um, because again, when we treat it, we're also unfortunately potentially increasing the risk of something developing down the road. The other things that we know to contribute to cancer, but we don't know exactly the specific mechanisms, things like diet and exercise. Thankfully, today I saw, and I'm quite um, impressed by the breadth of things that they're speaking of. So I, I, we have nutrition um, and exercise talks later in the day, environmental exposures. So, I mean, the one most people think about is our when they think of environmental exposures, asbestos. So if you had a risk from asbestos, and even though it was treated, that risk still exists. But there's other environmental exposures that can contribute to cancer. And then genetic predisposition, which um, a lot of people are getting more and more testing around. Um, most people are aware of BRCA, thanks to Angelina Jolie. Um, and so that is a risk factor that persists because it's in your genetic code. So just going into the different treatments. So for surgery, it'll be related to your specific surgery site. Um, commonly, like there's lymph node, um, when you dissect out or take out the lymph nodes, you can affect how the lymph drains. So you can see a picture here of someone who has lymphedema from their treatment. So these are long-term effects. They persist, may need special treatment from, in terms of physical therapy and, and have it revisited. If you had it once, at the end of treatment, you may need a refresher two, three years down the road. Um, the radiation, so uh, this is really important to us as providers because it affects any tissue exposed to radiation. So in this picture, you can see a gentleman that was treated for, probably for Hodgkin's lymphoma, and the difference in the muscle and, and tissue development because the radiation affected every level of tissue, top to bottom, or inside, outside to in, of the, um, of the person in, in that radiation field. So specific organs, so if we're talking about someone who got radiation to the chest, there's a heart in there, there are lungs in there, there's the esophagus, there's the thyroid, all of those things can be affected because the way radiation works is it causes inflammation and then scarring. And it scars and does a really great job of scarring down um, cancer tissue, but there's normal tissue there too. And so that's kind of the, the way to visualize or think about what the potential effects are. The other thing it does is potentially increase the risk of second cancers in those fields. And so it's important if you are talking to your primary care doctor and saying, you know, I have a little mole or a little skin thing that looks funny, emphasizing in my radiation field, because think of radiation as a thousand sunburns at once. So the same way as sunburn increases your risk, lifetime sunburns increase your risk of skin cancers, so does, um, so does radiation. Um, and then, depending on location, other organs. So if someone gets radiation to their breasts for Hodgkin's lymphoma, they are at increased risk for breast cancer down the road. Chemotherapy, there's so many chemotherapies, I'm not going to do every single one. The idea is to kind of have a general sense that they're, they are different, so you and each person's reaction to chemotherapy is different. Oftentimes, the interesting thing is radiation doesn't have as much effect at the time of treatment. People are like, oh, it's just on my skin, I put some lotion, it felt better, and it can have a late effect 20, 20 years down the road. Chemo feels terrible while you're having it, but oftentimes you're not seeing as much in the way of late effects. There are long-term effects, so you know the side effects off the bat. Um, they vary on class and agent. These, this is just a summary. I'm actually not gonna read every one of these because um, these are some technical terms, but just to see that there, they are different. Some cause urinary disease, others cause stuff to the heart, increasing uh, risk for like the steroids, increase your risk for bone disease or insulin resistance. Peripheral neuropathy, people who got cisplatin know about this, and carboplatin, those type of things. Um, then hormone therapy, um, and I'm sorry, I, I, in my uh, first slide about the framework, I did include stem cell transplant. I'm not gonna talk about it because you literally right after me are having a stem cell, stem cell transplant lecture, but that definitely has risks associated with it that are its own class of things. 
hormone therapy, um, you know, these are pretty common because breast cancer and, and prostate cancer are pretty common cancers. Um, and you're blocking this important chemical that's in the body that affects a lot of different tissues. So in terms of um, those that induce menopause, like tamoxifen or Remedex, um, you'll have symptoms of menopause, but also bone and heart health that can be affected depending on when you start it. And then chemical castration in the prostate cancers. Again, um, you know, sexual side effects, osteoporosis, fatigue. Um, sexual side effects exist also with hormone, um, uh, with the menopause inducers. Immune and targeted therapy is such an innovation, but is so new that we don't know as much as we would like to about their late effects. We hope that the, because they're targeted, it is limited, but we often, you know, I th it's not the best analogy, but if you think of the Titanic, there's a lot of the iceberg under the water. Like we're still learning so much about the human body. So we, we are continuing to understand what um, these things are targeting, what other cells they might be affecting, other tissues. So things like imatinib, Avastin, Herceptin can be taken for years. Um, we know less about their late effects. Um, rituximab is a one that is used a lot in um, lymphomas, and they can cause deficiencies in your immune system, um, and checkpoint inhibitors are things like, <clears throat> I'm sorry, this slide version doesn't show the other side of it, but checkpoint pemrolizumab, these are the um, ones you hear about in terms of melanoma and lung cancer and things, and they can cause um, endocrine ap um, problems or rashes. So sometimes when you get a rash, you think, oh, I'll just put some lotion on it. But if you're on one of these, you might actually need to see a specialized dermatologist to make sure it's evaluated. And then any treatment. Uh, again, this kind of speaks to our psychosocial umbrella, but certainly neurocognitive. Um, you, don't ha you could just nod along with me, like who's felt chemo brain, right? And you're like, when does this chemo brain end? I stopped chemo six months ago. We don't, you know, the truth of the matter is we can see that 75% um, of cancer patients receiving chemo experience it, and this can persist for months to years. And that's why you and not somebody else, or why someone else and not you, is so specific to the person. But we do know that exercise can improve it. There's studies, actually, that are being done at MSK that are looking at things like acupuncture and yoga for it. So other ways to approach it that aren't just powering through, right? We, that's a hard thing is particularly, um, you know, everyone is active and wants to stay active and your brain is a part of that. Um, psychological effects, there's a higher incidence of anxiety. This kind of talks to that idea of fear of recurrence and it's a very health related anxiety. Um, and it's really hard to, especially if you'd been healthy for so long and then you get a cancer and now you're thinking about your health so much more than you ever did before. Um, it becomes a cloud that affects a lot of the other activities in your life. Um, very appropriately, we, we should be doing a better job of screening for sexual dysfunction. It is a part of wellness, it's a part of how we feel like we interact with people in our world. Um, and you know that's important. And then the financial toxicity is very real. Um, we do see that. Uh, I want to say 41% of patients have some sort of, um, have to give up something in terms of bills or um, uh, other needs in order to try, pay for the cancer treatment. That's, and that persists. And especially if you're on some of these long-term treatments, like the immunotherapies, it adds up because maybe the first year they give you a discount and then you have to figure out what you're doing year to year, I mean, everything ends up being very insurance-based. So I know that someone had asked about slides being put up, but you know, these, so I'm, I'm sure they'll be available to you, but this is where I send people in terms of resources, because it's three different perspectives. Everyone says a, very similar things, but you can find different tools in each. One of them is um, MSK, not because I work there, but I think that they do collect a lot of information and resources for survivors. Um, Cancer.org through the American Cancer Society um, has a landing page that talks about survivorship during and after. 
And then ASCO is the American Society of Clinical Oncology, and they talk about the different guidelines and um, have kind of this compendium, this like toolkit for survivors and for providers. And sometimes that's what we're asking you to do is bring the website to your doctor and say, you know, this is the survivorship care plan that the American Cancer Society, can you help me fill this out? Can you help me navigate this? And show them those tools too, because you are our, our muses, you're our inspirations, and you're also our army to send the information out. So in that vein, thank you to Dr. Burton, Survivor Journeys, and my colleagues at MSK that allow me to come in and work with a population like you guys, and then all of my patients, because everything I learn, everything I'm inspired to do is because of them. Thank you.